And guys, I just ask, uh, I think everybody is muted when they arrive, but keep yourselves muted. And there is a chat feature so you guys can talk to each other. You can send each other private messages or you can send group messages and ask any questions as we go along, especially when our guest joins us. That's a really good way to uh, kind of ask questions in real time and uh, get them answered as we go. And then we will have time for a brief Q&A at the end. So if anything isn't covered before then, uh, we invite you guys to, to speak up then. So welcome to Australia. This week we are going down under for Wine Down Wednesday. And for those of you who don't know, I had the opportunity to spend several months in Australia back in 2016 and 2017. Uh, from a travel perspective, I am a Australian tourism excerpt expert uh, through Australia's Tourism Board. This is one of my favorite countries in the world. I've had such a great time traveling here and it really is a special place. So let's grab our passports and hop on a plane and we'll take the direct overnight flight from Houston to Sydney and touch down in this beautiful coastal city. So when you do leave the US traveling towards Sydney, towards Australia, you end up arriving two days later from when you actually leave. And this city is absolutely beautiful. The first time I saw the Opera House, I teared up. It was such an emotional experience. I remember Sydney being the first uh, real destination that was on my bucket list when I started thinking of places that I wanted to visit before I died back when, you know, I was like in college or something. And I just fell in love with this city. And I feel like it's such an easy city to fall in love with. I expected to like it, but I didn't expect to like it as much as I did. And you can stay right in the city and explore the cobblestone lanes of the Rocks neighborhood, which is an historic neighborhood. And you just have these beautiful views where you can see the Harbor Bridge, you can see the Sydney Harbor, and you can see that beautiful opera house. And the little restaurants and the little bars in that area have amazing views. And it's just a beautiful place to kind of wander around these streets and get lost and explore uh, different parts of, uh, of the area. Um, the beaches here are beautiful. You have the iconic Bondi Beach, which reminds me of Venice Beach. You'll see the, the bodybuilders and people kind of showing off and you've got that classic boardwalk. And then you have this beautiful pool at the Bondi Icebergs that juts out into the Pacific Ocean. And you can actually get a day pass to visit this pool. I visited I visited it and I did a yoga class on one of the terraces and then swam laps in the pool for a little while and you just have the waves crashing into it. Uh, they do close it once a week to clean it and to drain it and put new water in it. So uh, it's not always in use. I believe that's on Thursdays when that happens, but it's definitely a must see when you visit. Darling Harbor is home to some of some amazing museums. Uh, you've got the Australian National Maritime Museum and you can actually visit a Cold War submarine or explore a naval destroyer. Uh, Sydney Harbor by ferry is a really beautiful way to see just the coastline and to see kind of the iconic neighborhoods and landmarks. If you're feeling brave, you can actually climb to the top of the Sydney Harbor Bridge. And this is a really fun thing to do for more adventurous families. If that's not quite your cup of tea, uh, you can walk or bike across the bridge. That's what I did. I wasn't strapping myself in and climbing to the top of it, uh, but it was a really fun experience. And then the beaches around Sydney are absolutely beautiful. I mentioned Bondi Beach, and I think it's a perfect place to take a surf lesson and to just people watch and really enjoy kind of Australia's most famous beach. They have amazing coastal walks in uh, Sydney as well. One of my favorites is the Bondi to Bronte Beach, and it actually goes all the way down to Coogee Beach, which is further south. And you can kind of stop along the way. It's really leisurely, but it's kind of a really nice way to break up your walk and see some of the beautiful, uh, more less, less touristy beaches along the route. And then Sydney, 
is known for its festivals. Throughout the year, you have amazing festivals on the harbor, and there are fireworks displays, there are light shows. I actually got to visit Sydney for New Year's Eve 2016-2017, and got to watch the fireworks over the bridge. It was an absolutely amazing experience, and I loved it. Uh, I definitely recommend it. It's the first major city in the world to celebrate the new year, and it is just an experience unlike anything else. I, uh, I'm kind of a New Year's Eve person, and I love celebrating it in just wow. cities that have stuff to do and, and stuff to see, and especially when there's a beautiful natural backdrop that you can watch the fireworks over and you can bring the new year in. There are lots of amazing hotels to stay in Sydney. Uh, the Park Hyatt Sydney is probably one of the most iconic. It's right on the harbor. You've got those views from your room of the Opera House. Uh, but personally, I'm a big fan of the Shangri-La Hotel. So you can see it in that middle picture. The hotel is actually just behind the Opera House. And so you have way better views of the harbor from the Shangri-La. And they also have a rooftop bar that is a bit expensive, but it's one of the most amazing places to have a drink and to watch the sunset. And it's located higher up in the Rocks neighborhood, which has access to all of these iconic pubs and different local restaurants and it feels authentically Sydney. And then the Langham is another property that I really like. It's a little bit more boutique compared to uh, the, the other properties. It has less than a hundred rooms. It's still in Darling Harbor, but you're not gonna be right on the, on the water. And, uh, and it's just another favorite of mine. That being said, there are lots of other options in Sydney. There are more boutique options. There are some beautiful boutique properties in more of the residential neighborhoods that I recommend as well. So when the world kind of resumes uh, travel and gets back to normal, if you are planning a trip, I would love to help you kind of find the property that's right for you. Since we are in the the time of road trips, we're going to hop in our car or with our driver because we are driving on the opposite side of the road and head two and a half hours north along the coast to the Hunter Valley region. And Adele, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Hunter Valley region and the history of the wine there and let's, uh, let's start our wine tasting today. All right. Am I on mute? Am I on mute? You, we can hear you. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Um, so I've never been to Australia and I've always wanted to visit. It's just like the thought of that super long flight just makes me apprehensive being in a small tube for how long is the flight? Uh, I believe it's about 15 hours. Oh, yeah. It's not that bad. You fall asleep. It's, it's fine. <laughs> One day, I guess, I'm, yeah, have some, some more time on my hands and like really go down there, spend more than like 10 days, like I'm talking like maybe like two or three weeks to like really get to know because there's so many different parts of Australia that I think are, are interesting and especially when it comes to like the wine making part of things uh, and it seems like all of the major cities have some sort of like wine producing area that's famous, that's world renowned, that makes really good quality wines uh, just within its grasp. So again, like this is just a two hour drive away is the Hunter Valley, which is one of Australia's most notable regions for producing quality wine. Um, but Australia didn't always used to produce quality wine. I mean, the, the vines originally came to Australia um, at the same time that uh, it was a penal colony, but no one had any winemaking experience at that time. It wasn't actually until the mid 1800s when uh, there was promise of gold in Australia that other European settlers came into uh, Australia. And of course, with them brought vine and knowledge of winemaking and and all those other skills and and that's kind of when um some wineries sort of emerged and the quality or potential for quality uh of um great wines sort of came about to the rest of the world um two producers i think that everyone has probably been familiar with like penfolds and lindemans for like quality and then of course i'm sure a lot of people have heard of yellowtail the buy it in every single gas station grocery store crap wine. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of the yellowtail, but at some point, I'm sure when I was, you know, 19, 20 years old, you'll drink whatever you can get your hands on, right? <laughs> For sure. 
Um, the Australians developed the bag in a box technology, little known fact. Um, and they also, if you notice a lot of your bottles from Australia, actually the three that we have today are all Stelvin enclosures, which are the screw tops. Um, Australia is huge proponents of this method of storage and shipping for a lot of their wines. Um, so here we are in Hunter Valley. Um, this area is sort of like a flat river valley that's gentle rolling slopes. And here in um, Australia, there's a couple grapes that grow really well. And the first of which is Semillon, which we'll get to taste one a little bit later. Uh, we also have Cabernet and we also have Shiraz. Um, there's a really special environment that creates like, the most amazing, amazing environment for Semillon to grow, um, unlike any other place in the world. Uh, the great Semillon is, is something that's unique to Bordeaux, France, and then Australia as well. Um, I think it's uh, an interesting one. We'll go into some tasting notes later. I don't want to get ahead of myself on that one. Uh, but then also in this area, Shiraz and Cab being other important grapes to know. Um, there's some other wine regions that um, are fun to visit too. If you want to, yeah, there they go. Um, if you are looking to like expand your trip beyond the Hunter Valley and kind of see what else is around there. Um, so it's a very small map, might be kind of hard to see, but specifically where we are is just a little bit north of Sydney into the Hunter Valley. Um, right there in the middle is the region of Riverina, this big fat sort of blob, big area. I don't know if you can see where that one is, Kristen. Um, mm -hmm. That right there, that's where all of the poor quality grapes are grown. That's where you get the wine, the, the grapes that are grown in, um, in like yellowtail shiraz. It's this very like flat, heavily irrigated, not great for growing quality grapes, but great for growing mass produced grapes. Um, further south of there around Melbourne, um, there's a little small area called Mornington Peninsula, which is I think a total sleeper zone when it comes to really good quality Pinot Noir. A lot of people would overlook on like a wine list. Uh, further south from there, Tasmania. Tasmania makes wine. They make really good sparkling wine using Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. You would never guess. Uh, but I guess being so farther south, you just got to think like it's the opposite hemisphere of where the United States, most of our wine growing regions are sort of in like the northern part. Uh, for Australia, all the quality wine growing regions are on the southern part. It's it cooler the more southern you are and, and warmer uh, further in the north. And then if you're to venture all the way over to Western Australia, the region of Margaret River is well known for classic Riesling, dry style Rieslings. Um, and then if, of course, if you're gonna go to Adelaide and visit the region of Barossa Valley, which is famous for Shiraz, there's also McLaren Vale, which has the Shiraz that I prefer to drink, it's a little bit lighter in style, lower in alcohol, a little bit more mineral driven. But other than like these other really cool regions to visit and you can totally dive into all sorts of different vineyards and soil types. Australia seems to make like one of every type of wine in its vast continent. Um, but there's other like really cool things to do while you're there. Um, I think Krishna can tell you some more things. There's some other ideas other than visiting wine country. Yeah, so Hunter Valley is a really great place to combine with a visit to Sydney. And it is, and Australia as a country has positioned itself in a way where in the past few years, it really has focused on its food and wine uh, kind of as a, in, in every part of the country. So in the Hunter Valley, you have these amazing cheese factories. And I know uh, Adele actually carries some of the cheeses every once in a while at 13 Celsius. And they are absolutely fantastic. And they pair perfectly with that semillon. And even with the big Shiraz, like the intense flavors just seem to complement each other really well. Then you also have this dense forestry area and can take on the Great North Walk and the National Park nearby. And then there is the, the ominously named Deadman's Trail, but it's really not that bad. Uh, I know when you're eating and drinking, sometimes you just need some time to move your body a little bit and switch things up. And that's a really great way to kind of have leisurely hikes in the nearby areas. If you're into horseback riding, which if you know me, you know I love doing that. It's one of my favorite things to do. You can explore lots of this, uh, lots of these landscapes by horseback as well. One bucket list thing to do in Australia is to take a hot air balloon ride over the Hunter Valley. This is 
one of the things that they do here, and you can see all of the vineyards and the beautiful rolling hills from above. Uh, and then you have Newcastle, and Newcastle is a little bit, uh, it, well, Newcastle is on the, on the coast. And it's actually a World War II site. They have, or they, they have World War II history um, museums along there, and there's a coastal walk. I actually did it when I was in Newcastle and in this area, and you can board one of the old army planes, the uh, the Arrow Hunter, and actually take an acrobatic ride through the air, and it's super cool. Uh, if you're a golfer, there are tons of golf courses in the area, and they're only about a 30-minute drive away, so golf, wine, perfect relaxing combination. And if you're traveling with kids, there's the Hunter Valley Zoo and the Hunter Valley Gardens where they can kind of run around and you can mix things up a little bit just so that they um, can burn off some of that energy while you guys uh, keep tasting wine. And then as far as places to stay, I love the Spicers Vineyards Estate. This is a little cottage that's kind of tucked away in the Hunter Valley. I love sending my clients here when they visit Australia and it's perfect for a couple uh, looking for a romantic getaway and it's a good place where you can stay for two or three nights. And I think that's one thing that I really want to note about the places that we're discussing uh, today if getting to Australia takes a long time and if you have two or three weeks to really travel in the country and enjoy it, then 100% do that. But one of the best times to visit this, uh, this country is in our winter. So during our holiday break, or if you want to avoid the peak season pricing over spring break. So March, you're kind of still getting that summer weather, but you're on the other side of like the, the summer heat and the summer crowds. And Every place we're talking today, you can do it as a first trip to Australia without having to get in planes to travel across, across the country because the continent is really huge. And you could actually visit all of these places that we're talking about today in a week. And two nights here is a great way to visit the wineries that we're talking about today, that we're visiting today, and to mix in some other activities depending on what your interests are. So with that, Adele, why don't you tell us exactly what it is we're drinking today and let's open up our first wine, the Silkman Semillon. Hooray, wine time. I hope everyone is drinking something in their glass. If you guys didn't pick up the wines today and you want to come back and pick them up tomorrow and, and hopefully remember all the lovely tasting notes from today, uh, we have plenty more at the bar for you guys. Um, but um, I wanted to show if we were going to do something from Hunter Valley, Semion super famous. I wanted to show a very, very well-crafted, high-quality uh, Semion as an example of classic quality winemaking. Um, why this grape? Why this region? Again, it's a good grape I'm sure a lot of people have not heard of before. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like it comes from the region of Bordeaux, uh, but it's often blended with Sauvignon Blanc and in like the white Bordeaux format. So for some reason in Hunter Valley, it has found its home. And Hunter Valley itself, it's, it's pretty humid and it's quite warm, which doesn't normally lend that itself to, to making white wines. Um, but there's something about the winemaking process where they intentionally harvest uh, the grapes a little bit earlier because they ripen a little bit earlier. Therefore, they miss out on some of the heat and they miss out on some of the uh, the late rains that happen in February. Now, again, we're, we, they harvest in early February because, again, opposite sides of the hemispheres, you know, we, we harvest in, you know, August, September. They harvest in, in February and March. Um, but with this grape ripening a little bit earlier, um, the alcohol is lower. If you're to look at this wine, the alcohol content is 10.9%, which is pretty low for a white wine. And it's, I think, really typical of the style, but unusual for other whites, just overall in general. Most white wines, you know, 12%, 12.5, maybe 13% or, or higher if you're having like a super oaky California Chardonnay. Um, but with the lower alcohol, it causes uh, or it helps to to maintain the level of acidity being really really high and what we like about wines that have high acid is that they they withstand the test of time they're ageable wines when you first pour this wine into the glass it's super like watery clear like it's, it almost doesn't have any color to it but if you were to age this wine for five years 
the color would start to deepen, the texture of the wine gets even better, it slightly oxidizes a little bit, and the flavors become more and more complex. Uh, that's why wines from the Hunter Valley made from Semillon are super, super collectible and high-end because of the way that this wine ages. And having like a 20-year-old Semillon uh, is something that is treasured and a lot of like serious wine collectors will have in their collections because the flavors of it are just like super, super unique uh, and special. You can also use Semillon to make dessert wines. Um, and also there were some sparkling wines from Hunter Valley that are super famous because Napoleon drank them. And this was, maybe it's a rumor, who knows, but according to all the wine history books, when there's this huge exposition in Paris celebrating Bordeaux wines, Napoleon himself was drinking Hunter Valley Australian sparkling wines. It's kind of like contradictory and highly, highly, you know, political and, and scandalous. Um, he would, he would. He would, right. Uh, so this wine in particular is uh, a collaborative effort between a husband and wife who are professional winemakers. They've been working for other wineries and this is like their own side project. They purchased some really good quality fruit. Both of them, um, Liz and Sean are their names. Um, they only make a handful of wines and they grew up in the area and they're fully immersed in like the whole lay of the land. So they know like what has really good fruit and who doesn't. And so they only buy their fruit from the best growers um, to make this style. It's aged only in stainless steel and it spends a little bit of time on the lees. Um, there's no oak on this whatsoever, but I think that this wine has an interesting texture. Um, and that's just kind of stylistic um, of Semillon. It's kind of waxy. Uh, and, and that's a usual indicator of any Semillon, um, whether it's old world or new world. Um, but there's also some like lime, there's some citrus to it. And I think it's a really elegant wine. I would definitely pair this one with, of course, any sort of like white fish, something that's really light, vegetable focused things that you really want the acidity in this wine to sort of come through and help to like balance out a, um, a nice light summer dish. Kristen, what you, did you get a chance to, are you gonna open this one today or? I haven't opened this one. I uh, try to keep it to one bottle at a time. Uh, <laughs> so I'm actually drinking our third bottle today, but I love Semillon. I love white wine. Uh, I don't like to play favorites when it comes to white, red, rosé, but uh, white is definitely one of my summer go-tos. And you had me at 10%. Um, I love just posting up and being able to enjoy a bottle of wine and then not feel guilty or drunk if I open another one. And uh, so I'm a big fan of the lower alcohol wines that can pair well with food and uh, that I can, you know, make and that I don't have to feel bad about if I want to open another one with a group of friends or, or something like that. So I'm excited to try it uh, probably probably this weekend. What about our next wine? The next wine from this um, is the Leo Gate Estate. And what's super cool is when I was looking at this on the map, um, Silkman, Leo Gate, and uh, the other wine that we have they're all like five minutes away from each other. It's, they're like like all neighbors on like this one road. So if you ever wanted to visit all three of them, you could probably just like walk between winery and winery uh, or, or location and location. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so the Leo Gate Estates, this is kind of a, a fun blend of Shiraz, a little bit of Merlot, a little bit of Cabernet. Um, and it's from a winery that used to be called something else that recently um, switched uh, switched hands and it used to be called the Tempest 2 winery and, and some owners came in and, and purchased it and they transformed it's not only like a winery but it's also like a wedding venue and a restaurant and just like a really cool place to hang out and be amongst the vineyards in like the hills um, but uh, the oh there we are yeah. There's a picture. You can kind of see like the facility sort of in the middle there, like with like the beautiful rolling green mountains in the background and the vineyards like right there. Um, so there's something that's kind of interesting about um, red wines from Australia is that sometimes they have this eucalyptus kind of thing going on and it just sort of depends on like if there's actual eucalyptus trees in the area where the, the vines are being uh, grown, that they have that sort of like slightly like minty thing going on. Um, 
they're also a little bit softer on the palate. There's more rich, dense fruits and a little bit less less tannin. I would say that this is like a medium body Cabernet. I wouldn't say that this Cabernet Blanc, sorry, I wouldn't say that this is a full bodied wine, despite having Cab, Shiraz, and Merlot all in the blend. Uh, I think it's a, a good quaffable red wine with a little bit of a chill on it, especially. Um, it's pretty simple and, uh, and fun and easy to drink. What would you pair with this wine? This is something that like, I mean, a cheeseburger. Like, I don't think it needs to be some, something super over the top, fancy, elaborate uh, dinner. I think just like a, yeah, cheeseburger and french fries. Yeah, um, I love that we have a wine like this uh, as part of our selection today, just because being, I know, I've, I've said this a million times, but I know here in Texas, we love our red wines and we love uh, being able to drink red wine in the summer. And so I'm always looking for more of these medium bodied red wines that are, um, I guess, non-traditional takes on like very traditional varieties and styles of wine and uh to be and wines that we can really enjoy with food and so i love that we uh have included this tonight as as a kind of medium it's it's a good in-between wine of the of the other two right yeah and and for those who are environmentally conscious it is all organic which love i had it. when a, so I, we, we had a wine class a couple of months ago, like pre-COVID, and I had the, a special guest, Sam, who came in and was just kind of like, kind of talking smack on like the whole like organic things. And if you look at the definition of like what organic means, it's like an, like made of carbon and like made of things. And so I guess everything is organic in some sense of the word, but at least in the winemaking terms, someone had to come out and certify, well, you'd pay someone to certify your vineyards um, to prove that they're organic and, and not use any chemicals and pesticides and treat your, your land right. Well, my experience, I'm glad that you mentioned that because my experience when I visited some of the Australian wine regions a few years back was that there is this dedication to sustainable practices. And I think, you know, we all saw earlier this year just uh, how many parts of Australia were really devastated by the fires. And so I think there is this, these sustainable practices have come out of necessity even to be able to conserve the land and to make the environment uh, more friendly and to set it up to last for a long time. And I love that Australia's uh, uh, chefs and farmers and winemakers have really played a role in kind of pioneering this effort and being driving forces in it. Which is really interesting because I haven't had a chance to really talk to anyone from Australia just yet to see if there was smoke taint affecting any of the wines after all these fires. Um, because I know that smoke taint, you can't necessarily tell until after the wine is finished, like after it's already fermented and aged, then you taste it and they're like, oh, it's smoke taint, it's ruined. Yeah, we talked about that um, when we were drinking some Chilean wines a while back. It was 2017, yeah. I think. If you ever want to uh, experience, if you, if you guys ever want to try a wine and see if you can taste that smoke taint for yourself, Chile's 2017 wines are kind of a good uh, example of a current vintage that's on the market that you can probably easily find to, to see that. And it doesn't always make the wine bad. It just is definitely noticeable that there were extra environmental factors at play uh, when it was being made. Well, with that, why don't we, Adele, why don't you do the honors of welcoming our guests today as we uh, get into our third bottle of wine? I am super duper excited about this because um, the, uh, again, welcome Mike and the Eloise, I'm going to say it again, D, <laughs> we're all like looking at, there's so many vowels, so, um, but I first tasted this wine, and I was like, holy crap, this is like really good, and I'm, you know, not a, always the biggest fan of New World wines, I'm such an old world Italian drinker, but I really, really enjoyed this Shiraz, it was one of the best that I've tasted in a long time, so, hi Mike. <laughs> Mike, go ahead and unmute yourself, and why don't you tell us about uh, what it is we're drinking right now? All right, thank you for having me. Can you hear me all right? 
Yeah. Yes, we can. Oh, beautiful. Um, yeah, massive thanks for having me on board. And um, it is correct. Yeah, you're right. It's just a, uh, a name full of vowels. Um, it's pronounced Julius. So it's like almost like the first I is silent. But yeah, whatever you say, everyone kind of knows what you mean anyway. When you that one, D, D, and everyone kind of gets it here anyway. So it's, it's hard to say everywhere in the world. Um, it's Italian heritage. So both my parents immigrated to Australia um, from Italy. My dad was from Abruzzo and my mum was from Sardinia. Um, and yeah, I've, we've sort of been in the Hunter now for, well, my being the Hunter, I was born in the Hunter, born and raised. Um, we, um, I, we started uh, with a small vineyard in uh, one part of the Hunter, but the, this phrase that we've got now, just moving on to, to that is, it's actually an old Lindemann, Lindemann's vineyard was planned in 1968. Um, which was a pretty important time for for, for Australian viticulture um, because anything planted pre-68 was basically was pre-nursery. So if you wanted to plant a vineyard prior to 1968, the only way to get the vine, the original vine material was to befriend your neighbour or your friend or a vineyard close by, um, go there during pruning, take the cuttings, propagate them yourself and then plant the vineyard. Um, that You couldn't just ring up an order um, a bunch of great covenant cuttings. Um, so this is uh, this, this is uh, what I would what well basically what we had is a a vineyard that that produces um, what I think is a really traditional hunter Shiraz. It's really sort of medium weight. And you know I'm, I just caught the end of your discussion about the Leo Gate wine and about that that medium bodiedness to, to that wine. And that's that's really typical hunter. I mean the hunter for me with red wines is all about medium weight. And it's all probably a little bit more about wines built around sort of tannin um, and acidity rather than fruit and alcohol. Um, so th they are a little bit more savory. So if you do have a palate that does tend to lend you a little bit more towards Italian style of wines, you know, you're gonna love Hunter Reds. I really get that with this wine. When, uh, when I opened it, before we got started tonight, uh, I wanted to just taste it and familiarize myself with it. And I was surprised by how I really noticed that savory quality to it right away. You do get that fruit, you do get uh, that that's pretty characteristic of what I think of when it comes to Australian reds in general, but it does have like almost like a bit of meatiness to it. And uh, Adele and I were talking about what we would pair with this beforehand and barbecue hands down what do you what do you like to eat with this wine um i mean i i honestly uh, you know 17 for us was in that warmer riper year i can see that sort of bar because it is has got that sort of riper fruit character for for hunter um i love anything sort of gamey with this like you know australia is known for its lamb um i love lamb with hunter shiraz it's just got that sort of earthiness um, and that sort of meatiness to it. It's got that little bit sort of more sort of, you know, as you said, that sort of meat character, um, anything with that, uh, you know, sort of a little bit more flavor to it and that more sort of meatiness, gamey kind of character works really well. Reds. I've got a quick question for you, um, specifically about this wine and the Stephen uh, Vineyard. Um, I know it's red volcanic soil. Is that typical or different or unique of Hunter Valley as a whole? So the Hunter as a, as a region, so obviously a valley, um, yeah, it's not a really obvious valley, but there are the, the broken back mountain range behind us. Um, not the broke back mountain range, just the broken back mountain range yeah. behind us. Um, the, the, and there is, um, so what you tend to find in the valley, there are some, some rises of red volcanic soil, which does tend to be, and around the sort of the edge of the mountains where that more volcanic soil is, you'll see red vineyard planted. Um, and then down on the flat and down on the, the creek flats and the old sort of more sandy alluvial sites is where you'll find semion planted. So you, and I mean, it was as simple as uh, I think as back in the, in the day when though, cause I mean, the Hunter is one of the oldest wine regions in the country. And, um, and it was basically white wine, white grapes planted on white soil and red grapes planted on red soil. Um, and that's, that's how they, you know, the viticulture of if there was the soil was red, they'd plant red grapes if the soil was white, but down on the creek flats, down that sandy alluvial sites, they'd plant whites. Um, so you, you will see these sort of volcanic outcrops um, and basically the creek flats where you've got that more alluvial, sort of more sort of sandy, broken down sandstone um, where the whites are planted. That's very interesting. Um, of the research that I've been doing, I haven't found any 
books or, or sites that break it down like that. That's really cool. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where if you come to the when when you come to the hunter, you yeah you'll get a little bit more of a feel for the area and 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 see why yeah why the whites are planted on the flats and why the reds are up on the hillsides or on those sort of rocky outcrops of you know little hills and and Stephen's the really unique thing about Stephen is it's um, it's actually contour planted as opposed to planted in straight rows. So as you you know you drive through most viticultural regions, you'll see you know, rows running north, south or east, west. And um, this vineyard is actually contour planted 180 degrees around a hillside. So you can imagine tractors don't actually like driving around corners when they're, when they're plowing or when they're doing anything or sprays. So it actually, the orientation of this vineyard, you get basically go the whole 180 degrees around the hillside and you'll find in years, um, you know, certain side like the western side and the cooler sort of wet years you might find that the western side with the little bit more exposure a little bit more um, heat will ripen a bit earlier so you'll that'll be your peak of those years the, the warmer hotter years the eastern side that gets the afternoon shade works a little bit better um, and works works well for that so it's a it's a really interesting site bit of culturally around that and it is just sort of this dome of volcanic soil that they've planted this vineyard around the the outside of it very cool Mike, we do have a question. Um, one of our guests, Kenny, is wondering if you're familiar with our other two featured wines, the Silkman Semillon and the Leogate, and uh, what you think of them. Um, Silkman, I mean, Liz, Liz and Sean Silkman are basically the, the pioneers, well, not pioneers, so the sort of pioneers of the next generation of, of Semillon in the Hunter. Um, Liz is, uh, you know, I can't, she's, I could be, if I could be half as good a winemaker as Liz, it would be awesome. Um, but she is an unbelievable winemaker, particularly with whites. Her, her Semillon and Chardonnays are, are exceptional. And um, I'm not 100%. It was the, I didn't quite catch the vintage of what you were having. Uh, first the up it was, the, was it 17 or, or 18? The, 17. Or 19? <laughs> yeah. 17, yeah, so similarly, which is a really classic hunter year semi on. Like, I love the 17 Sems. Um, 18, uh, you know, dude was a little bit of a warmer year, so a little bit more sort of softer and poor, but really classic Sem. I think that actually was from a vineyard. I'd, I'd have to check with Liz, um, but I know all her Sem do come from those Creek Flats and those. I actually think it's from a vineyard basically in between us and Leo Gate. Um, right on the creek flat there, really traditional style, you know, that lovely sort of citrus, um, sort of lemon pith, but that acidity that, that holds those wines together. But yeah, Liz is an absolutely phenomenal winemaker. I mean, her um, Chardonnays particularly are unbelievable. Um, yeah, the Leo Gate guys are actually across the road from us. Um, so I do know those guys really well. I'm not 100% familiar with the blend, but their site um, is a, a really old, a older vineyard um, in the region, really well established, and one of the the you know, a really good quality site for really quality grapes. Um, those guys, Mark over there, the winemaker, is doing a fabulous job um, with what they're doing. Sixteen, though, uh, I mean, the, uh, just quickly about the differences. So I believe that was the sixteen, the one that you had earlier. So yes. 16, a little bit of cooler, wetter wet year in the Hunter. Um, it is going to be a little bit more in that sort of savoury, um, really medium weight sort of style. And then we, so the 17 is our first of basically four years of drought. Um, 17 for us, a little bit warmer and riper. Um, and yeah, it was, was our last really, until the last couple of months. But yeah, seven, or the end of 16, um, well, mid 16 was when we had our last sort of really decent rain um, up until, yeah, like, two months ago. Um, and it, from then it was pretty dry throughout a lot, lot of above average summer temperatures, below average rainfall. Um, and it's been, yeah, really sort of hot and dry leading into the summer that we just had that I caught at the end of your discussion there about a little bit about bushfires and heat and which we yeah. had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a, a two-part question from Mary. Uh, she was wondering, uh, what is the name of your helper in the photo and what is his breed? And oh, that, that, that's a her, that's Lucy. Okay. She's over, on the She's over there. She's a groodle. Or I think in America, you call them golden doodles. Yeah. Uh, we don't call them... We don't call them golden doodles here because a doodle is actually Australian slang for a part of the male anatomy. And if you go around asking people to show 
you want to see my golden <laughs> doodle doesn't go down as well. Um, that's a good. That's good well, to know. So Americans, if you're ever going to Australia, <laughs> don't yeah, ask have, about the doodles. Uh, don't ask about the golden. Don't ask to see my golden doodle. I have a groodle. <laughs> good to know. And good the to cat know. that just walked past the floor. That's of unknown origins. The cat. I can't tell you anything. About <laughs> don't go doodling breed. around. That was a rescue. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then second question um, from Mary was, as a producer, do you create and produce your wine for the local Australian market or uh, the, or more for the international market? And who is, uh, what, what is your predominant market? Uh, we're about, so just a little bit about us, we're about 60% of what we do, we sell direct to consumer. Um, so we actually, people coming to visit our cellar door, um, joining our mailing list, joining our wine club. And then we're around about 30% to our distributor, local distributor, who then on sells to um, bars and restaurants. And then we're a really small amount, about 10% of our production to um, goes to export. And the US is obviously one of our, our main export markets. Uh, I've been working with the guys there for, for a number of years. And um, it's been you know, really interesting to sort of grow with them. Um, and so, look, when, you know, at the end of the day, when we're quite like, you know, at vintage time, I mean, you, I mean, you, the, it's not, to say it's not about the, it's about trying to make the best wine possible. Um, there's no really delineation between what we're doing for domestic, mm -hmm. what we're doing for direct to consumer. Sure, stylistically, like, you know, maybe like rosé or something like that, we're trying to craft a wine and get it to suit a particular style that we think the consumer is looking for. Um, but there really is no delineation between this is going to the US, we need to make it in this style. This is going to Asia, we need to make it in this style. This is what we're selling domestically. Um, it's just trying to do the best that we can with what we've got of that year. And I look, you know, it's, it's our climate's almost. So we do get a lot of our rainfall uh, traditionally um, in the midst of, of harvest, uh, which can be challenging. Uh, which would, it's actually what makes it so unique. It's, it's a little bit, I, you know, I think the, the really interesting thing about great Burgundy is about, you know, you taste the, vine the vineyard, you also taste the vintage, you know, you really see the variation mm -hmm. of what's going on. And as a winemaker, it's, you know, it's no two vintages the same coming on the back of 2020, which was probably one of the more interestingly challenging vintages that I've done. And, and, you know, listen to you guys talk before about smoke tank and, um, yeah, it was a challenge for us this year, trying to understand the science on, on smoke tanks, still um, a relatively new field. I remember, you know, when I was just starting out in wine and seeing wines and, you know, you'd, you'd try, you know, a 1968 and they'd go, oh, that was the bushfire. You can taste the bushfire in that wine. And, um, you know, n there was no real science behind it. Now there's, you know, there's a lot more science, a lot more research being done on it, a lot more understanding on how smoke tank and, but it's still such a new field that trying to understand it is just, yeah, it's why things, so certain vineyards are getting it. We've seen a lot of, um, you know, random stuff around New South Wales, particularly this year with, with vineyards being affected that we didn't think would be. And then others that were affected that, um, that weren't affected that were, you know, we've, everyone sort of wrote off and then they made wine off and the wine looks fine. And, you know, wines that were, yeah, it's been a really interesting season for us. Well, that's really interesting to hear. Um, I think that you answered one of the questions that came in while speaking about that. We had a question from the Rambies asking how the drought was going to affect the 18 and 19 vintages, but they, uh, they did say that they love the 2017 Shiraz and that it's beautiful. Um, and then... Oh, yeah, <laughs> the, no, Go ahead. Yeah, the drought's been probably the biggest, like, the biggest impact that we've seen over the last few years. As I said, the 17 was the first year of um, uh, like a four-year drought, basically. I've seen a gradual decline in yields. Um, the biggest probably impact was um, extreme heat. And we did have uh, a few, uh, well, probably 17, 19 and 20, where we saw a lot of days over. Um, I actually don't know the conversion, but it was uh, over 40 degrees Celsius um, and four or five days of that, what, you know, when you're in that sort of critical period. Um, so, you know, the, the, the 18s, we were really lucky. We probably had a bit of heat early, um, maybe affected the whites more so than the reds. The reds then, we had a nice long 
Um, but yeah, the water demand has been pretty intense of trying to keep things hydrated and keep things on vine and not shriveling up and not getting too ripe too quickly. Um, you know, it, it has been an interesting time. We, we actually planted an acre and a half of Triga National about 10 years ago. Um, it's an interesting one and, and one that worked really well over the last, set, like last few years of drought and that extreme heat. Um, probably reacts a little bit better than Shiraz to, to, to dry weather. Um, a little bit less water dependent. But yeah, it's been, it's, it's an ongoing issue, that, that drought issue that obviously they, they do with climate change and everything. We see, we're seeing, you know, more extreme dry spells for longer times and more extreme heat waves mm -hmm. for, you know, more days in a row than the year before. So it's been pretty challenging. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. We, um, I had a question from Lynn asking, does that make the 2017 one of the better vintages in recent times? Yeah, look, uh, there's, there is, because it's been for 17, 18 and 19 really strong years and there's a really big debate raging on in the, in the Hunter Valley wine making fraternity of, of what is the better year. Um, I actually, you know, I'm sort of, I prefer certain wines depending on what I'm having them. I like the, the 17s, they are in that riper spectrum. Um, how they will age will be interesting. I think they will age, so you know, they're, they're, it's a good problem to have when you've got three really strong vintages in a row, um, to be able to just debating which one you think's the best, because I think they're all, if they on standalone vintages and they're all, they're all exceptional. Um, I like the strength of the, the 17s. I like that they've got a robustness to them. Um, the, the 18s are probably a little bit more in the, the prettier sort of, more sort of gentle spectrum. Um, and then the, the 19s are, are sort of a bit like, bit like 17 again. How many cases do you produce? Uh, depending on the year. So normally, um, and yeah, kind of a little hard question to ask to answer that because the normal year, because we own and manage um, about 80% of the vineyards that we own. So we've got about 80 acres of vineyard that we, that we look after and, and that are ours. Um, we then buy in a little bit of extra fruit. So a normal vintage for us would be somewhere between around about 190 to 250 tonnes of grapes. Um, this year with the drought and the smoke and us not getting in as much fruit, we're about 140 tonnes of grapes this year. So it's really dependent, but somewhere in the vicinity of about 12 to 18,000 cases of wine or dozen, 18,000 dozen bottles of wine um, would be kind of normal for us. But yeah, it is really, we're, we're so dependent on the weather and the, the cropping levels and what's going on. It, it does vary quite dramatically from year to year. And I think Eric has a good uh, follow-up question, kind of uh, getting into that a little bit more. Are you seeing the growing and the growing harvesting and crush window changing uh, with the changes in the extreme heat in 2019 and 2020? Yeah, really. Well, I think it's the same. We're just seeing now a more like it's starting a little bit earlier. We're seeing we used to sort of our um, equivalent of the 4th of July in Australia is the 26th of January, which is the, the Australia Day public holiday. Um, and that was always our sort of kick off. I remember when I started on um, when I started doing vintages 20 odd years ago, it was always around that Australia Day weekend that we'd look at. That's kind of the start of vintage and where things are going to start. Now it's sort of around the 15th, 16th. So it's, come, it's coming forward about a week to two weeks. Um, but what we've seen is a real con, like a condensing of the vintage. So where it used to spread out over six weeks, it's now we're picking everything within a four week window. So it's not unusual to be done by, you know, probably just after Valentine's Day, where we used to be like first week in March. Um, I think 17, uh, we were finished. We'd picked everything by Valentine's Day. We'd, we'd, we'd had everything off. Um, I mean, maybe we might've picked the Tariga after, but it was all, it was pretty much done by Valentine's Day, which is really early. I'm um, actually was in, um, managed to get fit in a trip to the, to the U S in, in the, on the first week in March, which I didn't think I was going to get to, but I got to in 17. Just in time. Oh, lost it. Yep. <laughs> um, so Mary had a question uh, for, for both of us, uh, it looks like. She wanted to know how many days you would give for a somewhat deep dive into the Hunter Valley. Um, I know the Hunter Valley has over 120 different uh, wine or different vineyards and winemakers uh, right now. Um, from a tourism travel standpoint, I would say uh, 
probably four nights if you want to have a little bit of time breaking it up and not just drinking for three straight days. What would you say, Mike? What do you think would be the ideal? Yeah, that, of I'd say three, three nights, four days would be perfect. Um, I mean, there's so much going on in the ballot. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're really lucky. We've got such a, a really strong local food scene and, and some of the best restaurants and the best chefs in Australia are, are just around the corner from us. So we're super lucky um, with that. And there is some awesome restaurants. I mean, realistically, like I'm, you know, obviously quite into wine. And when I go to a wine region, I, don't, I can knock out. <laughs> Yeah. If I can knock out four to five cellar doors in a day, you're doing pretty well. I would say the average person can probably do three, you know, four max. Um, and, you know, if you can do probably a good three days of tasting and visit maybe a dozen cellar doors out of that 120, uh, I reckon you're doing pretty well. And you can get a good mix. You can get some of the bigger guys that, that and I mean, look, the Hunter, as the region, we produce you know, less than 1% of the total production of wine in Australia. So we're not a massive region. Um, a lot of the growers around, there are 120 cellar doors, but a lot of those guys are, you know, would be less than, you know, 2,000 cases. Um, the, the, you know, the more, and I use the term commercial um, with a bit of inverted commas around it because us small that are, that are in it full time and it's our full time gig, that we actually sell wine to there's probably only really about 30 of us that are that are more the commercial rather than the hobby guys that mm. are they're in it full time like you know ask leo gay and then you've got other the older brands like tyrrell's and and uh, mount pleasant broken wood um but yeah there's there is a lot a lot to do and then once you start doing the stuff that isn't involving food and wine and if you're into golf or if you're into hot air ballooning or or um, the ballooning is fabulous just to get a, a really good perspective of the of the valley. Um, if you can um, get up and do that early on in your stay, I would highly recommend it to go up and have a look. I'll be up there and just get that perspective of what I was saying about earlier about the, the old creek flats and seeing the vineyards on the flats and seeing um, the more volcanic soils. It is a great perspective and a great introduction to what we do. I'm glad you mentioned that before uh, before you hopped on the call, we kind of went over some ideas of other things to do when you're visiting the Hunter Valley and you're just uh, reinforcing everything I, I said before. So I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear that as somebody who uh, lives there, you feel like those are actually really cool ways to really cool experiences to have while you're in the Hunter Valley. And last question for you. And then I know I'm sure you have, plenty of things to, to get to this morning. Uh, what are your top three favorite bars and restaurants in the area? In the area? Um, oh, there's my top three. There's a new restaurant that's opened up that I, I'm, I, when you said barbecue, like I love meat, like I'm, I'm and there's a new restaurant. So do Texans. Opened up. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a new restaurant that opened up a couple of years ago. Um, really great friends of mine opened it up. It's called Yellow Billy and they do everything over open fire. Um, so you go in and you, you know, you get your, your lamb or your pork or your beef and everything's cooked over open, open fire, even in the middle of summer, which is stinking hot and you can go in there and harvest and have a really great steak. And, um, you so said that's, Yellow that's Billy? Good, Yellow Billy. Yeah. It's, it's unreal. The, the food's, food's fabulous. A little bit more formal, um, Muse, Muse restaurant is probably one of the, the more sort of fine dining places. If we've got people visiting, you want a, a really nice sort of formal experience. And um, Troy, uh, Troy Rhodes Brown is the, the head chef there. And he's one of the top chefs in the country. And um, it is, yeah, a really great experience. Um, so, and then the third one probably should go to a bar, but I did notice on the start of your um, presentation, uh, or no, it was within the presentation, there was the Spices Guest House. Their, yeah, their bar there is for, for, if you're not into that real sort of pub style drink, they've got a great sort of uh, bar within the, the complex there that is a great spot to go and spend a Friday afternoon. Their cocktails are unreal. Um, and you can go on a couple of hours and, um, then you need to get some kind of transport home after there because once you've been a couple hours there, uh, yeah, you're out pretty quickly. 
Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Mike. It was a pleasure to have you. you. And uh, I think the general consensus from everybody is that they love the Shiraz and it's drinking beautifully right now. And it looks like we have some people who uh, prepared barbecue for dinner tonight. One last question. Can you repeat the, the name of the formal restaurant that you mentioned? Mute. Yeah, M-U-S-E. M-U-S-E. Yeah. And Mike, I just want to say, like, this is so cool that you're there in Australia and we're here in Texas and we're able to drink your wines as a group together. Like this is, this is so cool. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to hang out with us. Like this is awesome. No, no, massive thanks to you guys for doing it, putting it on. It's easy for me. I'll just get up. I'm unfortunately, yeah, it's only 930 here. So I'm in, I'm on coffee, not wine <laughs> yet, but I'll, I'll have one tonight. Um, but yeah, massive thanks. If any of you, uh, when, when all this madness dies down and if anyone um, that you know is heading over here, please don't hesitate to get in contact. Um, we'd love to have them to the winery, can show them around, um, have a look at some stuff in barrel, whatever you guys like. But yeah, please do come on, come and back, come back to Australia one day. I'll be back to the US when all this madness finishes off. But yeah, Definitely. can't wait to get to Texas. And Mike, I do know we have some local Australians who actually joined, local Australians here in Houston, Texas, who joined us on the call today, who haven't been able to visit home this year, who are very excited about this because they feel like this is their, this is their connection today. <laughs> and um, so we do really thank you for, for being here with us. And it was a pleasure to have you. Um, and we, you are 100% welcome to stay on our call. We're going to dive in a little bit and continue our journey through New South Wales down to the Blue Mountains, but we'll have another little brief um, five minutes or so for a Q&A at the end. So if you have the time, um, we yeah, would love I'll to go invite you to Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, guys, from the Hunter Valley, we are going to continue our road trip uh, down south to the Blue Mountains. And this is one of my favorite uh, parts of this region in Australia. It's an easy uh, drive from Sydney. It's an easy drive from the Hunter Valley. And so, like I said, if you are visiting Australia on uh, spring break in March from Texas, you can actually visit all of these places with only seven or eight nights on the ground. You can't necessarily do a deep dive into them, but you can do a couple nights in uh, Sydney, a few nights in the Hunter Valley, and then a few nights in the Blue Mountains. Uh, the Blue Mountains are absolutely beautiful. Uh, parts of it were affected by the fires this year, but there were many parts that were actually spared as well. These are the three sisters, and there is a very family-friendly walk if you have younger kids who are going with you, where you can go to the viewing point and see these sandstone cliffs. They've been here for 50 million years, and if you're into photography, I recommend going at sunrise or sunset because the way the light plays on them is absolutely breathtaking. There's also the scenic Skyway gondola, which crosses the Jameson Valley. And you can see views of the Three Sisters. You can see Mount Solitary, Katoomba Falls, and just get these panoramic views of the area without having to necessarily do any of the more strenuous hikes. The world's steepest incline railway is also in the Blue Mountains, and it descends more than 400 meters down into a long tunnel and gorge, and then ends on the valley floor. And then you have Govitz Leap, which is one of Australia's most famous lookout points. And you have these views of cascading waterfalls uh, that go down into the valley. I actually was able to do some of the, these hikes in the Blue Mountains. Um, it was one of my first experiences driving on the opposite side of the road. And uh, it, was, it was manageable, but it is pretty easy to take the train into uh, the Blue Mountains as well from Sydney. And there are lots of uh, easy hikes that you can do as well. Um, my favorite property in probably the entire country of Australia is the Emirates one and only Wolgan Valley. Uh, the general manager has become a really good friend of mine and he is, he's so much fun. He's everything you want in hanging out. He's everything you want as a Texan visiting Australia. And he's just a delight. Uh, the property is absolutely beautiful. And those of you who know, know that I work with lots of the one and only properties, the 
reps from the other properties always say that this is their favorite in the entire portfolio. It is gorgeous. And this is the property in this photo. It's only two and a half hours into Sydney. Um, if you aren't squeamish about helicopters, I highly recommend taking a helicopter from Sydney down to Walgan Valley. Uh, it's about 30 minutes and you see the Blue Mountains from a helicopter and it's absolutely amazing. This property, uh, one, our networks uh, awards last year of um, for sustainability. So they are dedicated to conserving the landscape and to taking care of just the entire area and the wildlife, their farming practices, everything. So this is a perfect follow up to your Hunter Valley trip. This is how I would recommend any ending any trip in Australia before heading home, whether you're flying around the entire country or whether you're just staying in the state of New South Wales, but it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and then there is so much more to see in the Blue Mountains. I mentioned the gondola. The waterfalls are incredible. Uh, they just cascade over these ancient cliffs and into these cool little pools and it's absolutely beautiful and then you do have this blue lake that almost has an otherworldly color to it because of the algae that grows in it too, that grows in it and then you can actually uh, go into the caves as well and you see these uh these rock formations that are super old and if you are into the glowworm experience too. You can actually visit caves where there's no light and you can see bioluminescence uh, of the glowworms that hang from uh, caves in the region. And so with that, I wanna thank Mike again, I wanna thank Adele, and I wanna thank all of you guys for joining us today. Next week, we'll be continuing our journey a little bit farther south down to the southern island of New Zealand. We'll be visiting Marlborough and central Otago and diving into some world famous Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. And with that, I would like to open up the floor for any questions you guys might have uh, related to wine, related to Australia, anything we didn't cover beforehand. Um, but real quick, before I open that up, uh, I do want to thank those of you who uh, made donations this past week. As you guys know, this is something that uh, Adele and I have been doing since April, and it's been um, a really great way to stay in touch and to have fun together, to travel, to drink wine, to explore wine regions from home um, during this really unusual time. If uh, you guys are interested in donating to our Wine Down Wednesday event, all of your donations go towards our production costs uh, to keep this running. And I send that out in an email and it is 100% optional and up to you, but we, will continue on regardless and we are super excited for next week. So with that, I would like to open up the floor to you guys and uh, see if y'all have any, any questions, comments and jump in. You can uh, unmute yourselves. I've got one. So uh, for Mike, um, it's kind of Australia in general. So I was able to um, hit the Barossa Valley and McLaren Vale the uh, end of 2018. So how would you compare, but I haven't been to Hunter Valley, how would you compare Hunter Valley with Barossa and, uh, and the Vale? From a wine style perspective or from a wine tourism perspective or? Uh, from, a, from a total wine perspective, not so much from a tourism perspective. Yeah, look, um, they, they are really distinctly different styles. As, as I sort of briefly said at the start, I find that Hunter um, Hunter, particularly Hunter Shiraz does tend to be a little bit more built around sort of tannin and acidity. Um, whereas what you'll see in McLaren Vale and Barossa is wines built a little bit more around sort of fruit and, um, and alcohol. So you'll see a lot more richness in, in that sort of style of the, in their style than what we, we are a lot more medium body. We are a lot more in that sort of savory spectrum. Um, but the really unique thing in, sorry, um, is, uh, the really unique thing about what we do is that uh, more um, 
yeah, that, that style of semi-on that, that you saw in the Silkman, I mean, there's nothing else in Australia where you can find that. You can't go, you can, you can go pretty much anywhere and see different styles of Shiraz, which is the thing that makes Shiraz unique. But semi-on and that Silkman semi-on that you tried first, I mean, you can't find that anywhere else in Australia other than, than there, than, than in Hunter. Perfect, great, thank you. No worries. Any other questions, guys? This is a kind of meta question for y'all's region overall, but does basically like knowing nothing about, almost nothing about Australian wine production, does everybody like own and estate produce and that's kind of the norm or are there a lot of um, conglomerates that then produce or, you know, send their juice and then produce wines at, at vintning productions? Um, in the Hunter, uh, there are a lot, because there's a lot, as I was mentioned before, there's a lot of really small brands. So there is a big uh, contract winemaking facility that basically looks after the, the manufacturer, like making the wines. So a lot of people have small vineyards that they um, own and manage, and then they will then send the grapes to get contract made. Um, there's a lot of that in the, in the Hunter. Other regions though, like the Barossa, there's a lot more, um, sort of larger brands so they would most of it would be would be the other way there'd be a few sort of smaller brands getting contract wine made but most of the place would have their own wine making facility um so it just kind of depends where you are in the hunter it does tend to be um a lot more contract made than um than um than made in-house um and there's uh, there is sort of a growing number of of sort of like virtual winemakers or virtual wineries is probably not the right term, but um, people that have, you know, no vineyard and no winery that actually buy grapes and get them made elsewhere and, and just own the brand. But that's sort of a growing area of the market as well. The people that, that but, just go and buy the grapes, get them made and then sell them themselves. But if the first wine is any indication, um, that's not necessarily a sign of quality or lack thereof, unlike in France, where it's a pretty good, or particularly in like Napa and Sonoma, it tends to be a pretty good indicator of someone that, you know, grows, bottles, produces all the way from start to finish. That's not the case in the Hunter then, it sounds like? No, like the, the, the well, Liz is one of the, Liz Silkman that made the first wine, that's her brand, but her, her day job is making wine for other people and um, I mean, she is just a absolutely phenomenal winemaker, and if you can get her to make your wine for you, you're doing pretty well because she's she's going to knock it out of the park every time. Um, and do like do ab well, I mean, obviously, you need the raw materials. You need to be looking after your vineyard. You need great raw materials to start off with. But you know, she's she'll take whatever you can get to her, and it'll be pretty amazing by the end result. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. Does anyone else have any questions for Mike or for Adele or any comments, anything you'd like to share? If anyone didn't get a chance to pick up the wine, I have plenty more at the bar to swing by. And this coming Friday, we're doing a barbecue pop-up with Beaches Barbecue. So it will be a really good excuse between 6 and 8 p.m. to come and get hot barbecue to go and a bottle of this because I think it would be like a really nice pairing together. Um, if you guys want, I've got, I got plenty more. I just had a little comment about the Blue Mountains. I went last week or two weeks ago, which I haven't been for years and it is phenomenal. If you do get to, to Sydney, it is only about an hour and a half, two hours drive on the correct side of the road um, to, to go to drive to the Blue Mountains. It is phenomenal. The walks are super easy. You take your kids, they're all well signposted. And that picture that, that was up there, which looked like it, like you can go and take that picture. It's so easy in the Blue Mountains. It, it's, it is like you just you'll use up all your your starter stories just taking photos everywhere you go is is just the most amazing views um the walks are great and there's also for those of you that aren't as walking and probably a little bit more drink inclined there's a really great new brewery that's just opened up in in the center of the blue mountains in katoomba called mountain culture um i met the brewer a couple of weeks ago he's from kentucky um and he is doing some awesome beer craft beer in the blue mountains which is uh great after your big long walk. That's really cool. What a, that's, that sounds like the perfect way to end a day of long hike, long walks to me. <laughs> yeah, a brewery tour and a couple of big glasses of nice cold beer was great. Mm -hmm. What was the name of that brewery? Mountain Culture. And so if you guys have, 
I know many of you have been paying attention to the chat. I have put the restaurants that Mike recommended and the name of the brewery in the chat. So uh, if you can't find them, just scroll up or uh, shoot me an email and I'll send them over to y'all. Well, guys, if you last last call for questions, does anyone have anything questions or comments? If anybody else has anything they want to say, want to jump in, uh, now's your now's your time to speak to ask Adele to ask Mike. Um, you can get me and Adele again next week, but this is your last opportunity for for Mike. Mike, honestly, last this call. is one of my favorite wines I've had this year. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. Oh, uh, thank you so much for, for, for drawing it. And, and shipping some to the States. That appreciated too. <laughs> hey Adele, hold, hold, a, hold a case of that Deulius for me. Do you have that much left? No, but I can get more, I can get more of it. You can get more? Okay. All right. I'll be here. I think Thursday is the delivery day for, for that distributor. So. Okay, okay, okay. I'll catch I'll up with you. Let me talk to him right now. <laughs> it was a hit, Mike. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, can't wait to see you all in the hunter. Thanks for having me. Likewise. And when you do make your way down to Texas, please reach out. We would love to get in touch with everybody who joined us today and let them know you're in town. If you set something up with 13 uh, to do a, a meet and greet or an in-person tasting, I'm sure everybody on this call would love to come see you in person uh, if they can't make it to the hunter. Hopefully Valley. sooner rather than later. Hopefully. Well, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> Well, have All a good right, one, Mike. Yourself, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank Enjoy you. your evening. You Bye. too. And thank you all for joining us tonight. It was a pleasure to have you. And we will see you guys next week when we visit New Zealand. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. We'll be back next week. <laughs>